Welcome back for section five of Principles of Sustainable Management, Frameworks of Sustainability. There are a number of frameworks that professionals in the field of sustainability use to do their work. This is a list that I've put together. You could add others. There is nothing sacred about this particular list. But these are the ones that I find are the, the ones most used. In sustainability, you have the management fundamentals, you have leadership, and then you have sustainable systems. These systems differ from tools. Tools are, for example, corporate sustainability reports or life cycle assessments. And these things are happening more and more. They came up from essentially unheard of in the early 90s to now essentially every big company on earth issues one. Frameworks are organized systems of ideas that give you a platform upon which you can implement the principles of sustainability or, or the principles of behaving in ways that are more regenerative. All of us come at this field with different skills, different interests, different needs, different clients. So which framework you pick may change depending on whether you're working in agriculture or energy policy or materials flows or simply helping a company decide whether or not it wants to make a commitment to become more sustainable. Let's start with perhaps the most fundamental framework, which is how is it that we look at the economy of the world? Ecological economics was created by Herman Daly, Bob Costanza, Bill Rees, Josh Farley. These are eminent thinkers who realized that the way that the world was approaching the discipline of economics was, it was very limited. It saw economics as this limited process where we dig up materials, we put them through various resource crunching activities, and then we throw them away. But this activity, this flow of money and stuff through the economy, exists within society, which exists within the biosphere. So that the triple bottom line approach of seeing the economy, society, and equity issues, and environmental issues as separate but occasionally overlapping was actually wrong. That the economy is a, if you will, wholly owned subsidiary of society, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere. And this concept of the economy within society, within the environment, is critically important if you're going to understand why certain activities are unsustainable and how it is that we achieve more sustainable approaches. These are some of the key concepts of Herman Daly, Josh Farley's book, Ecological Economics. Again, the economy is a subset of the ecosystem, not the other way around, that the focus of the of modern economics has been on throughput and that unless we look at the laws of physics laws of thermodynamics we're going to come unstuck that the attention has been on this little limited linear process not on the larger ecosystem and that if that little linear process is destroying the ecosystem, it itself will come unglued. That economics must drive toward a steady state economy that is not growing. The ideology of growth on a finite planet is the ideology of a cancer cell, as Edward Abbey once said. And that our focus must be not just on how do you make the most money, but how do we enable what it is we're doing to endure essentially indefinitely, certainly to serve future generations, 
and that we are just, equitable, fair in distributing the resources of the world to the generation that is here today. Herman made the excellent point that when he was uh, chief economist of the World Bank, actually this was in a speech that he gave when he quit that job and said that the, the, the bank is violating the basic principles of good economics by counting consumption the more stuff we buy and use and throw away, as if it were income, and particularly the consumption of natural resources, that income is the maximum amount that a society can take this year and still have the same amount to take next year. That the way the bank does balance of payments accounting, urging developing countries to sell off their natural resources is bad accounting, it's bad economics, and it's bad for the country, and that what we ought to be seeking to do is to enhance human and natural capital and enhance the productivity of natural capital in the short run and then invest in increasing its supply over the long run, that we should move away from the Washington Consensus's concept of globalization as the the, the more we speed up the throughput of money and stuff, the better we'll all be. That might be true if the only two forms of capital that mattered were money and stuff, manufactured and financial capital, but those are two of at least four forms of capital that also include human and natural, which being place-based are not enhanced by increasing the velocity of trade, which is what globalization seems to do. And so Herman said we should move toward domestic production for internal markets as the basis of international development policy. This work has been carried on by Pavan Sukhdev, who was the chair of a group called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which sought to understand what is the economic contribution of intact ecosystems to the economy that we count. And they found, of course, that the value of intact ecosystems far exceeds the value of the economy that we count. They found that, we, that, that there are a set of tools, if you will, that they, that should be applied to ensuring that ecosystems retain their integrity, that they are able to continue to give us value long into the future. The uh, things like subsidies, we, the world's governments, spend something like five trillion dollars a year subsidizing the mining and burning of fossil fuels. And if we were instead to take that five trillion and use at least a small part of it to enhance the productivity and viability and integrity of ecosystems and ecosystem services, we would get far greater economic value. In 2012, they created uh, TEAB for Business. This was a coalition of TEAB and the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, one of the brightest of the accountancy bodies on the planet. They created a natural capital declaration that many companies have signed, pledging to try to properly count the value of ecosystems as they do their financial accounting. And uh, as I said, a lot, number of large companies have signed on to this. Natural Step. Natural Step was an effort by the Swedish cancer doctor, Carl Henrik Robert, to answer the question of why do children die of cancer? And the answer that he got when he asked this question was, we live in an unsustainable world. And he said, what does that mean? What would a world that is sustainable 
look like? And he went through dozens of iterations of trying to set forth the principles of what a sustainable system would be. He started with basic science, things like the laws of thermodynamics, that matter and energy don't appear and disappear, that they tend to spread spontaneously, the second law of thermodynamics, that biological and economic value is in the concentration and the structure of various forms of matter, and that plants, green growing things, are the only net producer of concentration and structure. Natural step took the Holdren-Ehrlich equation of IPAT that impact equals population times affluence times technology and looked at what's happening in the world today. They created what they called the funnel of resource capacity and effective demand, what is it that we're asking of the planet, and that gives us the range within which we can conduct economic activities. They called it the margin for action. And they said this margin is declining as we harm the environment, as we use up more of the resources, that if you project this far enough into the future, we will lose the ability for action, for a, a healthy economy. This is, if you will, the definition of unsustainability. And that what happens to companies that ignore this is they bang into various sides of the funnel. What they ought to be doing is aiming for a sweet spot that extends resource capacity, drops our demand on the Earth's resources, and that building this runway to the future, if you will, is the route to sustainability. So we, we're faced with fewer resources, less ability to absorb and detoxify our wastes, the need to restore, increasing population, demand, market pressures, that sustainable business is one that finds the way through the funnel. How do you do that, they said? You take what are, they called the system conditions of a sustainable society, in which nature is not subjected systematically to increasing concentrations of substances mined from the Earth's crust. What they call persistence, that nature is not subject to systematically increasing concentrations of substances produced by society, plastic. Production, that nature is not subject to systematically increasing degradation by physical means, the biological capacity of the planet is retained, and then prosperity, that human needs are met worldwide. These system conditions, say the advocates of natural step, are the basis that a company would use to plot its course through the funnel, finding that sweet spot that enables it to then endure. Holistic management. This is the work of Alan Savory, who said, you have to manage whole systems whether it be a farm, a company, a community. He said, what is the quality of life that you desire? And then what needs to be produced to meet that quality of life? And then project that far into the future, that this is the approach that will enable a manager to create an enduring system. They have a model of what are the processes, if you will, the tools that you walk through to develop a holistic context 
within which you can manage whatever system it is that you're dealing with. The circular economy, cradle to cradle. This was originally put forth by the Swiss architect, Walter Stahel, who said that the real value of sustainability is as a vision. He tells the story of the three stone cutters who were asked, what are you doing? The one said, I'm putting in my eight hours. The other said, I'm cutting this limestone into blocks. And the third said, I'm building a cathedral. And this style says, is the real value of sustainability. What is the cathedral that we seek to build? He says there's no such thing as short-term sustainability. And uh, this is Walter with Johann Rockström, the uh, head of Stockholm Resilience Institute, which uh, put forth the concept of the planetary boundaries. <clears throat> Walter says there are five pillars of sustainability. Conservation, the reducing the demand on the Earth's resources. Health and safety, taking care of people in the workplace. Efficiency of energy materials. These three give you a sustainable economy. To reach a sustainable society, he says, you have to er add social ecology and cultural ecology. And this is the realm of managing people and of ensuring that the proposals that you have are culturally appropriate. You start with what he called the cradle to cradle economy, using thing, making things so that they are more durable, using fewer materials, designing products so that they don't require as much material, recovering any scrap, repairing, reusing, remanufacturing, then recycling, and if you have to at the end, downcycling. He points out that most of the impact of our economy is in the digging up of the raw resources. 75% of the energy use, for example, in a product came from the energy used in mining. That only 25% of it makes these materials into the finished goods but it's in the making of the finished goods that you get three times the labor, and in this in a world in which what we need is more jobs. So we ought to be taking the material that we already have dug up and put all of the embodied energy into, and then ensuring that that material doesn't just get thrown away. We're going to need a lot of fancy materials, the heavy metals, the, uh, the precious metals in making the high-tech devices that we desire. And yet, most of us, when we're done with a smartphone, with a computer, throw it away. Where we've thrown it into landfill is a much richer ore body, if you will, than going out into the mountains and digging up the side of a hill. And yet we are recovering less than 15% of all of this material. It's just being thrown away. So organizations like Urban Ore are taking material that would go to landfill before it goes to the landfill, sorting through it, recovering anything that can be remanufactured, repurposed, sold. This is a for-profit company in Berkeley, California, keeping 20 tons of waste every day from going into the landfills. It is a round earth, and it's appropriate that on this round earth, we have a circular economy. 
doing this is the way to counter what you might call the liquidation economy that we're now operating on and which is pushing the planet toward collapse. And entrepreneurs are realizing that just as the early sailors, when they set forth for new lands, didn't fall off the edge of the world, that this is the way to build a world that works for everyone. So organizations like Ellen MacArthur Foundation are working with leading companies to engage in this circular economy. This is the Chinese visualization of what a circular economy would look like. McKinsey hired a very bright analyst named Dr. Marcus Gilles to look at what this would do in Europe, found that it would add a trillion dollars every year to the European economy to not throw the materials away, to recover them, to remanufacture them, to take what are called biological nutrients, waste food, and ensure that it goes back into the land in order to enhance the health of the soil, biological productivity. Dr. Anders Wiegmann, co-president of the Club of Rome, has recently finished a series of circular economy studies of most of the countries in Europe showing that a circular economy is a very effective way to limit climate change, that it dramatically reduces emissions of greenhouse gases and is a powerful driver of job creation. Here's my favorite circular economy company. Lanzatech takes waste gas, carbon monoxide, they can take carbon dioxide from steel making, oil refining, many of the industrial processes, puts microbes into the gas and from that creates useful products. Ethanol, plastics, this is a Chinese steel mill where Lanzatech is taking the waste gas and turning it into jet fuel. So you can have the recycling process of, for example, waste steel, but in the process of making it, you capture and capture carbon and use it, for example, in jet fuel, in car fuel, you can capture carbon and sequester it in durable goods, in various forms of plastics. We're going to need jet fuel for a while, and it's already been shown that you can fly very high performance planes on these sorts of fuel blends. The <coughs> US Navy's Green Hornet has been flying around on various biofuels. Biology. The framework of biomimicry says what nature does is create conditions conducive to life. Here's what we do. These are some of the synthetic compounds now found in mother's milk. Aldehydes, ketones, phenols, furfural. People, what are we doing to ourselves? So we asked nature, how are we doing? Not so well. Janine Benyus asked the simple question of how does nature do business? Because nature makes a wide array of products and services, but it does it very differently than we do. Nature runs on sunlight, not on big flows of fossil energy. Nature does not make persistent toxins. It makes dangerous things, but they don't hang around for hundreds of thousands of years like nuclear waste. Nature makes everything near to something alive at the temperature in which it's found. 
with no waste, shopping locally. In nature, carbon is not the world's greatest poison. It's the building block of all of life. And so companies are coming to Janine and the Biomimicry Institute, the Biomimicry Guild, to learn how to do this. So New Light, for example, is making plastics from waste carbon dioxide, having a, uh, a very good run of this. Natural capitalism. This is the approach that I have found is the best in working with companies. Holistic management is better when you're working with land-based operations. Some of the sustainability professionals have had very good luck helping people begin to conceptualize the concepts using natural step. Cradle to cradle, of course, is, is useful throughout industry. But natural capitalism, which implies that capitalism as currently practiced is not natural, is, I think, the, one of the fundamental ways that, the foundational ways, that we can begin today to move the system that we have incrementally in ways that are profitable at each step and therefore are attractive for companies to adopt toward greater sustainability. It was created by three of us, Amory Lovins, Paul Hawken, and myself, based off this question of how do we implement what we know we need to do? We've known that we're operating in unsustainable ways. Going back to Bucky Fuller, to E.F. Schumacher, to the Limits to Growth book by Dana Meadows, and yet we haven't been implementing the changes. What's it going to take? It was based on the book Factor 4. We were asked to write this for Ernst von Weizsäcker, the other co-president of the Club of Rome, for a German context, looking at what can efficiency do to solve the problems and do so profitably. Ernst then wrote the German policy section of the book, and I was quite touched when I was in Salzburg, Austria, to find at a university this tree ring with pins for various dates in history, including factor four. It also is based on Paul's work asking in his book, Ecology of Commerce, how can business operate honorably at a time at which companies, the dominant institution on the planet, are responsible for most of the harm being done to the planet. You can see that this was written back in the 90s. Increase in population and business, since it is the one doing this taking, has to ask itself, how does one honorably conduct business in the latter days of industrialism and the beginning of the ecological age? Paul laid out a set of principles of reducing consumption of energy by 80% within 40 to 60 years. This is very consonant with what the scientists are telling us, for example, we have to do in cutting carbon emissions. Provide secure, stable, and meaningful employment for people everywhere. Be implemented because it's what people want, because it's a more desirable way of life, because it honors who we are as people and how markets work. Go beyond sustainability to restoration. As Herman Daly said, rely on current income, in this case, solar income for energy, and be fun. The three of us spent three years writing the book Natural Capitalism. When we were about to bring it to print, we 
wrote a summary of it for Harvard Business Review, sent the draft in. HBR said, we don't get it. What are your principles? He said, principles? Huh. Well, efficiency, uh, biomimicry, the solutions economy. This is Womack and Jones's concept that you should be delivering the service people want as opposed to the thing. And Dave Brower's concept of CPR, conservation, preservation, restoration. So there you go, four principles. We wrote, rewrote the article for HBR. They said, brilliant, we love it. It became one of their most requested reprints. And I said to the boys, we ought to rewrite the book around these concepts. They looked at me as if I was daft. And they had a point. We were already late to get it to the publisher. So if you read the book Natural Capitalism, which is now going on 20 years old, you will find these four principles in the first chapter and never thereafter. We just rewrote the first chapter. And more recently, in actually implementing this stuff with companies, I've rewritten them. As originally written, they were nouns, efficiency, biomimicry. And I think what we need are verbs. So these are now the principles of natural capitalism, that the, the real use of efficiency is that it buys time. It pushes back the worst of the challenges facing us. And then we redesign how we make and deliver all products and services using approaches like the circular economy, like biomimicry. And then we manage all institutions to be regenerative of human and natural capital. In each of these steps, it is profitable. There is a business case for implementing these steps and implementing them in more or less this order. This makes it an approach that companies can take and use to drive change within their organizations. The book is in, I don't know, 30 some languages, several million copies sold, and is in many ways the basis for the book that I'm working on now called A Finer Future which takes everything that we've learned over the past 30, 40 years and brings it to the surface of how is it that humanity can avoid total system collapse and create an economy in service to life. The last of the frameworks that I use may be the most important, and that is John Fullerton's concept of regenerative economics. He points out that this is the current state of affairs. We, the planet, are in service to the economy, which is in service to finance. We're very good at flowing money into the financial sector. What's wrong with this picture? It's wrong way round. Finance is a tool to bring liquidity <coughs> to the real economy, which should be in service to life. The humble folk singer Pete Seeger said the key to the future of the world is finding the optimistic stories and letting them be known. So John is working with practitioners around the world to take stories of regenerative behavior of companies that are implementing a set of principles that he has put forth. He says, we, sustainability should be a result. In nature, nature is sustainable because it's regenerative. Where we are now is on the degenerative side of the scale. And green and so-called sustainability measures are better. That's coming up the ramp. We then need to move through restoration of damaged ecosystems and human communities, but that what we ought to be aiming at is not sustainability, but a regenerative system, and that it is this regenerative system that will get us to a sustainable world. He's laid out eight principles. 
And John and I argue about these, and there are other people who claim to have regenerative principles or principles of what it is to be regenerative. But in my 40 years of doing this work, these are the best principles that I've found. In right relationship, this is the concept of ecological economics, that the economy is within society, within the biosphere. Holistic wealth. Money's useful, but it's not wealth. Wealth is well-being. It is living in an intact community in a healthy ecosystem. It's shared well-being on a healthy planet. Innovative and adaptive. This is a nod to the evolutionary biologists who say that humans are innovative. That's just part of who we are. We're here because we bond and because we create. Empowered participation. For a system to work, the participants have to have a say in what's happening to them. Edge of effect abundance. This is one of the principles of biomimicry, that in nature, the most abundant ecosystems are where two of them come together, where a river meets the ocean, where a forest meets a meadow. Why? Because you have diversity. Abundance comes from diversity. Robust circulation. This is the concept of the circular economy. Seeks balance. As I said, we're very good at flowing money to the top. We're very efficient in that. And yet we've created this brittle system. We're not very resilient. But if you have a, a system that drives to be as resilient as it possibly can, it's not very efficient. What matters is this concept of harmony between them. And this goes back to many of the world's great religions, that what matters is harmony, is balance. Perhaps the most important point is that a regenerative economy honors community and place. The great poet Wendell Berry said, what I stand for is what I stand on. He is place-based. And you can have a vibrant global economy so long as every place has its integrity. Wendell said, because we have not made our lives to fit our places, our, the forests are ruined, the fields eroded, the streams polluted, the mountains overturned. Hope then to belong to your place by your own knowledge of what it is that no other place is, and by your caring for it as you care for no other place. This place that you belong to, though it is not yours, for it was from the beginning and will be to the end. This is the concept of being place-based. I think a finer future is possible. If we take these frameworks and apply them assiduously in everything that we do, we can build a world that works for 100% of humanity. We have all the technologies. Future is already here, it's just not widely distributed. And when we do this, we will unleash the greatest prosperity humankind has ever known. To do this, we need a vision of what it'll be when we get there. What does it mean to succeed? What is sustainability? What kind of a world do we want to live in? Bucky said we're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. And Hemingway said everything is your fault if you're any damn good. Let's do this. Let's take this responsibility to create a world that works for everyone, to build an economy in service to life. Thank you.